please join me. Well, let's see. Let's see, there we go. All right. One thing we know by his quick intro is if you came today thinking you were going to see Dow Jones, like the Dow Jones, you're sorely disappointed. And you can leave now, and I won't even be offended. But what I can promise, is that working now? Not really. What I can promise is for the next 45 minutes to share a journey of my life that has been fun and rewarding and full of entrepreneurism. And if there's budding entrepreneurs in here who want to work in your own business or work with others as entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs, who knows what the word intrapreneur is? Have you had that class yet? Okay, I'm going to use it today, so I'm going to define it right now. There's entrepreneurs who are driven to own their own business, to start something, to found something and have their own business. And then there's intrapreneurs who are key and integral employees in new companies, growing companies, big companies, and you know, they're typically a C-level manager or just a, a really important and critical component of a business, a business that's growing and developing. But just right up fun to have some fun. My whole life, and to address, is your name really Dow Jones? My dad is a comedian. He's the funniest guy. And he was golfing one day with a guy by the name of Dow Finsterwald. And they, he's a professional golfer. And he said, hey, you should name your son Dow Jones. And he's like, I'm going to do that. And he's like, no, you're not. And he said, yeah, I am. And I know you're not. He said, well, I'll bet you a dollar that you, do, that you don't. So my dad won the bet. I'm Dow Jones. My dad has a dollar at home. And he goes, this is the dollar I won when I named you Dow Jones. It has been the greatest thing that ever happened because I, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm out meeting people, building networks. I still run into people in kindergarten. They'll walk up. That I, you know, I was in kindergarten. And they're like, hey, Dow. And I'm like, Hey, dude, you know, I, I don't remember their name. I remember their face sometimes. But because of that, it has been really helpful in setting me apart and having people remen remember me. And I think, you know, that's what you want in business is you want to set yourself apart. You want to stand out. You want to be remembered. You want to be the one they think of when, oh, I need this or I need that. So I loved it so much that I named my oldest son Dow Jones. He graduated from BYU here last year in the finance program. I also want to give a shout out to my daughter, Katrina, who's here. She's in the business program. So good to see you today. Katrina's in the, in the finance program here at BYU. And Tanner, we mentioned, is in the marketing program here. But before I jump into my story, my story starts with what's most important to me, and that is my family. And so just to connect real quick, that's the Jones family, my wife, Katie, my son, Weston and his wife, Emily, who graduated here last year in the graphics communication department. And we have really been a BYU family, except I didn't go to BYU. I attended BYU, but I got my business degree from the University of Utah. My wife's a BYU graduate. And so far, all my kids, except this daughter, chose to go to the University of Utah, where she's the, the goalkeeper for the University of Utah soccer team. And so. We're a split family. You need to know that about me. I love to have fun. That's what drives everything. So let's go to the next slide. See the BYU. We've got some blinking. I live for boating in Lake Powell. That's kind of fun. And if those don't work, that's OK. I can do it without slides. And we'll go to the next one, maybe. <laughs> but, but it's really, for me, life is really about my family and keeping a balance. Um, I have had some successful mentors. I've had some of the top people in technology where I started my life in business who, see, there's just more of us, and there's a you, and we do fun things. And I just had to show this picture, though. So in, I talk about it, that's the BYU boat. How cool is that? If you're a BYU fan, you got to love that. If, and um, that's... an. Mastercraft that we had coded in BYU colors. And it was so funny. This last week, I was down at Lake Powell. And half the trip, people would come up and like, boo, and they should flash the U sign, you know. Or I'd get a lot of cheers and yelling. Or, you know, 
Some people just didn't care, right? But I love to, I love to wake surf. It's so much fun. And let's go one more slide and see what we got. I love to fish and golf. And why am I showing these pictures? Because it's about life balance. I'm going to talk a ton about work in just a second, but then I'm going to talk about keeping life balance. And go one more. I love to ski. Backcountry skiing is one of my favorite things. I'm a normal guy. I love Star Wars, Indiana Jones. I mean, who doesn't love James Bond, right? So I'm a movie guy. Every Tuesday night, because I'm cheap, I go to a $5 movie with the guys. Like we put the kids to bed, and then they all sneak out and go see a 9 o'clock movie almost religiously every Tuesday night. Why? Because you've got to keep balance, right? Family, work, fun. And I think that's it. Is there another slide? Ah, this is a great slide. We're going to leave this up for just a minute because <laughs> these are things that I'm going to try to piece together in a story, and you're going to, go, you're going to look at that right now and go, what, does any, what do any of those things have to do with one another? Which is part of my story. I have entrepreneurial ADD. I'm just all over the place, bouncing around, and my career's been that way, and it's been great. You know, there's that saying about, to thine own self be true. I could never have a job where I just sit at a desk being an accountant. I know that. I couldn't be an attorney. I couldn't be an accountant. I have to be building something, growing something, and if one of my companies that I'm part of hits, like, critical mass, and it's just, okay, now it's just growing, we're just going to operate this thing and try to churn out profit from it. At that point, I'm like, OK, I'm done. I've done my job. I'm bored. That's no fun. Next. And that's why I call it entrepreneurial ADD, because I just jump from one thing to another. So you need to know that about me a little bit. What I was going to say back before, the, while the slides were gone, I have been mentored and been part of people who are com completely out of balance. It's all about work. It is, I'm going to work so hard, and I'm going to have a successful company. And you know what? That's great for them. It's great. Often they lose their wife, their family. They never have those things. That was never a part or even an option to me. So I had to be an entrepreneur with a new set of, and a new set of rules or framework that was like, how do I do all these things and keep a balance? And we'll talk to that just a little bit because you either are going to find yourself in balance or out of balance. There's times in your life where it's OK to be out of balance. I'm OK with that. We were growing businesses. There was years where I traveled 200 plus days a year because we were outgrowing a business. And I had to be with the heads and CEOs of some of the biggest comp companies in the United States. And you have to be there. Skype doesn't work. You know, Phone calls don't work. They need to look in your eyes, and you need to tell them how great your product is or how great your service is. And you need to ask them for their business. And when you're growing a company, it might take that. So you do get out of balance. But then it's like, how do you get back in balance? But here's Tanner. Good to see you. Nice entrance right up front. Got a, got a chair saved for you. Um, and Tanner, you're in the marketing program, and he wants to be an entrepreneur. So I think it, it would be great. Um, so let me tell you a little about how it started. How many know, in here know that you want to be an entrepreneur? And how many are like, oh, I'm going to take the class and see if it fits. I don't know. Um, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I'm going to go to college and try to figure that out. <laughs> when, I, when I was a kid, I knew I wanted to have a business. I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. It was my DNA. I don't know why. It just was. I was organizing carnivals in the backyard to raise money for muscular dystrophy. I was doing little things to make, you know, I mowed lawns and had a snowblower, and I'd do anything I could to go around and make money. I was like, that's cool. I want to make money. But I loved doing it. It was fun to do that. So I took the normal path of any teenager. At 14, I got a job at a grocery store because I wanted money, bagging groceries. Dan's Foods, right there in, in, Ute, in Salt Lake. Who's ever, who has bagged groceries before, worked at a grocery store? Worst job ever, right? So I go one day, I sit there, and I'm like, I can't believe that I'm doing this. This is horrible. I'm making $2.12 an hour, and I'm bagging groceries. And I went home that night, and we had dinner as a family. And my dad has always worked for himself. And I said to my parents, I'm like, that was horrible. They're like, how was work? I was like, that was horrible. I hate work. They're like, well, works can be good. You need to learn to like it. And I was like, we just need to redefine work then, right? Because I didn't mind mowing lawns and doing other things. 
I said, Mom, Dad, how can I make some money? My mom says, well, my windows are dirty. I'm like, OK. We live in a, in, on the bench in Salt Lake. So we had some windows that viewed the Salt Lake area, big windows. She's like, let me teach you how to wash windows, and then I'll pay you to wash them. I was like, that's great. So we go out, and we got the squeegee and all this stuff. And you know, I'm washing windows, learn how to do it. And my mom's like, great, here's 10 bucks. And I was like, that's great. I would have earned that in four hours bagging groceries, right? But I'm like, mom, how much would you have paid me if I wasn't your son? She goes, well, a guy knocked on the door the other day and said he'd wash our windows for $75. I was like, great, that's what I needed to know. So you know, knocking on the windows of my neighbors, or the doors of the neighbors, hey, I wash windows. I'm a professional window washer. And I'm only $50. And they're like, well, that sounds like a fair price. And I'm like, $50? That's like two weeks of being at Dan's, right? Bagging groceries. I'm like, well, I'm doing, that's what I'm, you know, so I got some yeses, I started washing windows, and I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. I'm never working for anyone else again. I ate those words later, and I'll tell you about that, but I was like, that's the greatest thing ever. So through high school, I washed windows, because it was easy. I could do it when I want, I could go wash a house, do it in about two or three hours, make 50, 60 bucks, it was great. That was my kind of feeding my entrepreneurial fire. Uh, I did that, and I, then I went on a mission. And one of the greatest things of my life, serving the Lord for two years, in my case, 18 months, I served a sister missionary. Mission, it's okay. Because you were supposed to in 1983. They changed it. So I got an 18-month mission. It was crazy. And they were like, hey, 18 months, you can go home now. I was like, wow, that's so, that went so fast. But it was a great experience. I served the people of Texas, and it was, it was just awesome. Um, but then you come home from a mission, and you're like, now what, right? So I enrolled in college, the University of Utah business program, in the marketing department. But do you know why I did that? Because I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to know and understand how people think, how they make decisions, what makes them tick. You know? So that's why I chose marketing. I knew what I wanted to be, clear focus. It wasn't, I'll take some classes and decide. And that's OK. We all have our own journeys, right? But this was mine. So I'm going to study and learn everything I can about marketing. What's one of the best ways to learn while you're in college is to be doing it on the side. I loved having businesses, so I started a couple of businesses. Um, I kept washing windows, but windows were kind of boring. You know, I, want, I needed more. I'd figured that out. So I started a t-shirt company. Now, I'm not proud of this moment. But the name of my first company was Genuine Bullshirt. <laughs> the better breed, right? I mean, I'd served a mission in Texas. There was cows all over the place. I mean, I don't know. I was tracting one day and just thought, hey, what about Genuine Bullshirt? That's funny. <laughs> so clearly, I'll never be allowed to speak at BYU again, because I shared that innocent fact with you. But it's true. And if you Google Genuine Bullshirts, you'll see the logo, and it's cool. And, I didn't put it up here because I was being cautious, but it was, a, it was a success. It was like, wow, that's funny. We had different plays on it. It was this cool bull wearing a t-shirt, wearing a and, and we had you know, Party Animal, and you know, just all these different takes on it. And I had a great artist, because I'm not an artist. We developed that, and I wanted to prove that I could start a company and be successful while I was in college. So I knocked on the door at Nordstrom. Hard to get an appointment at Nordstrom with the buyer, right? The guy in Salt Lake. And he's like, oh, you're just a kid. You know what I know. I'm like, so I waited, and I waited. And finally, he came after I'd, you know, I'd never been told no, but it was just really hard on the phone. So finally, he showed up. I showed him. He's like, those are really cool. So let's try them. Salt Lake store got them. They did very well there. They expanded to the next store. And you know, they talk as buyers. The next thing you know, genuine bull shirts is you know, in Nordstrom across the country. And I'm like, a, you know, I'm a fashion expert. I have a, I have a clothing line called Genuine Bull Shirts. <laughs> so, you know, it's like the piano, the, you know, the piano tie. You know, I was, the, I was the Genuine Bull Shirt guy. And from that, I learned the greatest lessons because we do like field assignments and talk about this. And I was like, well, in my company, you know, and I'd write about it and talk about it and supply chain and what we were doing and who the target audience was. And so I learned by having a business while I was in college doing that. I, was, I think I was fortunate that it was successful, but you know, we get lucky sometimes, and those, those things 
define us or help us. Had that not happened, I'm sure I still would have found my dream to continue on. But eventually, that you know, as all things happen, genuine bull shirts were like, okay, that was fun for a couple years. It's gone. But I'd le I learned other businesses that spun off from that. Um, I learned that T-shirts are really easy to make, and there was pretty good margins in them. People would call, hey, you're in the T-shirt business. Our club needs T-shirts, or our elementary school, or our family reunion. So I'd order T-shirts from UPS, I'd drop them off at the printer, and then deliver them, and then, you know, instead of charging them $3, what I'd paid for it, I'd charge them eight or nine. And I was making, you know, a, a really good living on the side, doing that, having my T-shirt company. Things were great. I was really focused on school and learning and being an entrepreneur, and I was going to be successful. And I had a mantra. I was going to get a house. I was then going to get a boat. And then I was going to get a wife. Because that's the order of importance in life, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm at a University of Utah Mayfest party. I'm outside. I'm with my friends. This really cute woman walks, girl walks by. And I'm like, whoa, I'm nudging my friend. I'm like, check out that girl over there. You know? So through the course of the night, I met her because I was stalking her. Because that's what we do as salespeople, right? And we're just going to win. We're going to figure this out. So, and I met her, and I fell in love. And we dated for about eight, well, about 12, 14 months. And I'm, my thoughts are all messed up. Because that happens when we're your age, right? We're, we're like, what do I want? What's important? Who else wants a house, right, before they get married? I don't know. Yeah? But I, you won't admit it. I'm just honest because it doesn't matter now. I have my happy story to tell. But I was, like, so confused. So I looked at her, and she's like, look, where's this going? This is a great relationship. I like you. You like me. And I said, you know what? i got to be honest. You're messing up my life. This is not my plan. Well, my plan is not to marry you right now, of course. i got to run a business and learn and get smart and get wealthy, and then we can meet, you know? So I literally said, you know, you're messing up my life. Gosh, maybe we should just call it off for a while. So she's graduating from college. I still have two years of college left because I've gone on an 18-month mission. And, you know, fortunately, the Lord grabbed me and he shook me. And he's like, are you kidding me? You have just met the most amazing woman. Life's good. You're getting an education. And your priorities are so messed up. Stop and think about what really matters, where you are, what you really want in life, instead of just you know, being driven by things and being wealthy and having a house and a boat. You know? So out of the blue, I called up my wife, Katie, and I said, hey, can you meet for breakfast? I ran out and got a ring, and she thinks we're off, right? And I'm like, we meet for breakfast. I'm like, hey, do you want to get married? <laughs> Something like that. It was a long story. <laughs> long story. I actually had her arrested for DUI because she was driving, and I was tickling her while we were driving. And I knew the policeman. He pulled her over. It was a great, it's a great story. But I need like 10 minutes to tell it. So that's the short version. So she's crying in the back of the cop car. I'm crying in the back of the cop car. She thinks it's a joke because I've told her we're done. And in this moment of brilliance, I did the most important thing I've ever done in my life. And the biggest success was I found someone I loved. I put that above everything else and said, put it in the Lord's hand and said, it's going to work out. And it has worked out marvelous, marvelous, marvelously. So you have to listen sometimes not to just the things that are driving you inside, like your gain and I've got to go to college and I've got to make a great living. In fact, so many of us go to college because we hey, we got to go to college because I want to make a great living, right? I mean, there's other reasons to go to college. Um, but I hope you're here it, in searching and learning so that you can find true happiness in your life because that's what brought happiness in my life, and I just about blew it. I'm sure I would have found someone else or something else would have happened, but you know what? You just have to listen. So I'm married now, and I'm in school, and... We, I came from a good living, but you know, I, we didn't have much. My wife and I live in an apartment. I even suggested that we live in my parents' basement. She was like, that was the first fight we ever had. Like, I'm no way I'm living in your parents' basement. That's not going to happen, right? So I got to make a living. I'm back to like, OK, so got genuine bull shirts. That's going. Then it's making some money. I mean, let's, I, I'll be honest. It was successful, but it wasn't like I was rolling in cash. I mean, I was making some money, and we paid the bills. It was great. 
But, so I think back to what do I know, and I started a little cleaning company. At the time, the trend where they were putting these canvas awnings in front of businesses, backlit, and they'd have the name of the company. It was kind of their sign. I was like, oh, I'll start a cleaning company. I'll clean backlit awnings. Well, every good business idea has to be proven. I went and talked to some people. Hey, do you need your awnings cleaned? Yeah, look at them. They're dirty. This is my store. It needs to, you know, so I'm like, great. I got a great business idea. I know how to wash windows, so I can do that when we're done. It can be a package deal. Well, I, got, I did that for a little while, but there wasn't enough business, so I pivoted a little bit. Key business term, you've all heard that lately. It's really in vogue right now to use that word. Oh, I pivoted my business a little bit, right? It means I was kind of on the wrong track, so I needed to get on the right track, but we say pivot because it makes us sound cool. So I pivoted, and I decided to wash banks at night, drive through banks. I bought an old Toyota pickup truck. I went and got this giant pressure washer. I had it mounted in the back of the truck. It, you know, I asked my dad for a $2,000 loan so I could do all this, and now I had a cleaning company. So I had t-shirts, cleaning, going to school, and what was great is Wells Fargo gave me a contract. They didn't know they needed their banks cleaned. How am I doing time-wise? I, you know, I have a tendency to keep talking. Um, so I showed up one night in the middle of the night, and I cleaned their bank but I only cleaned half of it. Then I called their manager that's in charge of cleaning. I said, hey, I need you to go by this location tomorrow and check it out. And he go, he's like, what do you mean? I said, well, I cleaned half of it. You did that without permission? I was like, hey, I'm gonna do whatever I have to do to get you to realize that I want your business, right? So long story short, he shows up. Wow, it looks great. Come clean the other half, you're hired. You can clean all the Wells Fargo banks in Utah. I charged 50 bucks a lane, so it was like $150 a store. And I could do two or three at night, so I'd go to school, and I'd pull on these big rubber boots, drive around in my old pickup truck, clean banks, wash the windows, drive off. I'm an entrepreneur again, right? I've got a successful, thriving business while I'm in school. Loved it. So my journey so far is you work really hard. You put yourself in a position to, uh, to you know, have successes, try things. And I'm graduating from college. I've made it, I don't have any mounting bills, I don't have college debt, but I'm ready to go conquer the world. And I had the good fortune of being called by, well, I went with my school counselor, guidance counselor, she says, what do you want to do for a career? And I said, I want to make a, I want to make a lot of money, buy a house, buy a boat, I'm married, but those things I still want to do. She's like, well, how much money do you want to make? And I said, I want to make at least $100,000 a year. This was like a long time ago, right? She's like, whoa, we don't have anyone I can line you up with. Procter & Gamble's here tomorrow. You could meet with them, but that's like 30 grand a year in a car. And I'm like, well, that sounds, I should meet with them anyway, right? I met with them. I was five minutes into the interview, and the guy goes, this interview is over. He said, you have, you're an entrepreneur. Why are you here? You're going to drive around and go from grocery store to grocery store. It's like bagging groceries again, right? Don't do that. So anyway, I went to work for a company called Megahertz. We made modems. We made modems before the internet existed. I said, why do we need modems? And he said, well, they're really cool. They let, com they let computers talk to each other. I'm like, that sounds weird. Why would they want to do that? Well, you can share data from computer to computer. Like, wow. And people actually can log on to a computer and read the news or get sports stores. You know, they were on things called bulletin boards. I'm old. I'm sorry. You're all like, what is he talking about? <laughs> but it was the best move I ever made. It was this young little teeny startup company in Salt Lake City, Utah, three guys from Highland High School. They'd gone to the University of Utah. And you know what? After we started the company, we made these modems. The internet gave launch. We became the fastest growing company, not in Utah, the fastest growing company in the United States. A little company called Megahertz. We were bought out by US Robotics and then 3Com. The three founders of that company, who are dear friends of mine, walked away with a billion dollars for making a little modem that allowed computers to talk. It's a great story. Um, I ran sales and marketing. I had a chance to live in London. I had a chance to live around the, the, the country and ran this company. But why is that important? Why do I tell you that? Because I made a change from being an entrepreneur to being an intrapreneur right there. I didn't have a great idea. I didn't have a million dollar idea. The people that have talked here before in your lecture series, some of them have hit huge home runs. I'm honored to be their friends and know them. The Josh James and the John Pastana, you know, Omnitures and Scott Johnson, and they're just awesome. And they had giant ideas. 
I've been more kind of like a double and single guy, you know, singles, doubles, a couple of triples through my life, and it's paid well, and it's done great, and I've enjoyed that ride. These guys were home run hitters. I got to ride their coattails. I got to learn. I got to be part of that company. I was an entrepreneur. I was working my tail off, had a job, got stock options, got all those things. And I would tell you, if you're an entrepreneur, not to be afraid of those opportunities. In fact, sometimes to embrace them. Take a job with someone there in an industry you want to be a part of and learn from it. Get all the information you can, and then when it's time to step out on your own, I mean, most of those guys whose names I just told you were part of a company, then left and started their own thing because, oh, I got this. I know how to do this. Okay, I learned that. I understand that. So I would recommend not being afraid of being an entrepreneur as well as an entrepreneur. Megahertz, great success story. The internet, great success story. Mobile computing, right? I mean, basically, we sold modems for laptop computers. I learned that business inside and out. So a good friend of mine was starting a bag company. How many of you carry your laptops in bags? Yes, I see a lot of them. There's an OGO. Does anyone have a Targus bag? Have you heard of Targus, maybe? I don't know. Targus was like the bomb in 1995. We had these black bags. We were the only company that made bags for laptop computers. So I went. My friend had just started the company. It was about, we were doing, he was doing about three million a year in sales, which wasn't that much. And we took all our knowledge and we built great carrying cases for laptop computers. And in the next 10 years, we grew the company to about 900 million in annual revenue. We were the largest player in the mobile computing space. We made bags, we made little accessories, Bluetooth devices, all kinds of devices. And that was fun. Again, I was happy. I was an entrepreneur. I didn't own the company. I was the key management. I had an ownership in the company. And I was driving something and building it. It was really fun. And to grow something that rapidly in a space as mobile computing was becoming alive was so much fun for me. And those were the years that I was traveling and meeting with big companies. So that's how I got started. But after that, when, I, when we sold Targus, that's those dumb, that's those red bags up there. I mean, they were just boring, right? Can you believe we could do almost a billion dollars in annual sales with black boring bags? I mean, it was, it was awesome. <laughs> then, the fun, then the fun part started. We sold the company, and I got a phone call from a friend of mine here in Utah who owned Ogeo. And he's like, dude, you worked for a huge bag company. We're just trying to get started. You know, I've got these cool golf bags. I've got some bags. Maybe you could come help me. That's what's nice about being successful and having some successes is then all of a sudden, if you built the right network, which is one of my critical components for each one of you to do, in your, net, in your, entrepreneur, in your entrepreneurial quest is to make sure along the way you're building a great network. Meet with people. Find people that you respect, you look up to. Get to know them. Make sure they know who you are and get to know them. <clears throat> but I worked with Ojo for a couple of years, helped grow, brought all my knowledge, helped them grow. And I finally said, that's it. I'm going to go do my own thing now. I worked, I've spent you know, 18 years helping other people build wildly successful businesses. They took care of me along the way. We had a lot of fun. So I wanted to build a company that was close to home. I was tired of traveling. I wanted to be in balance. I wanted to mentor and teach my children. I had two young boys that were teenagers. So I knew cleaning. I knew there was an underserved need here in Utah for car washes. It had never been my desire to be a car wash guy. But I said, hey, let's open a car wash. I did a bunch of research, found out they were a need. There was a changing model. We opened a car wash in American Fork called the Firehouse Car Washes. We invented the concept. I came up with the plans and the ideas. I sat down with my sons, like, let's come up with a cool name that people will remember. Let's make it different. Let's make it unique. So we had squirt guns. Like, as the cars would go through, the kids could sit in the lobby with, like, these guns that, shoot, that shot uh, soap at the cars, you know? And it was themed, and it was you know, a lot of parents will say, my kids will only let us go to the firehouse car wash because it's such a fun experience to go there to wash the family car. And it was fun. And Tanner got to go to the architectural meetings. He got to go to the city council meetings, the planning and the zoning. So it was a great entrepreneurial experience for our whole family. We built this business. And it was kind of, I thought, well, this would be a good hobby business. But it actually turned into be making a lot of money business. 
I liked it. So I was like, well, let's build more. So I acquired some car washes. We built some across the Wasatch Front. I had six. We added some Jiffy Lubes. And the next thing I know, they, my boys had now been part of it. They were managers. Things were going great for them. And I learned another really valuable lesson while we were running the car washes. And that is, you never know where the next business is going to come from. Right? So while we're running car washes, my, my uh, son said, hey, what if we fix rock chips? There's like, we see a thousand cars a day at all these car washes, and they all have broken windshields and chips. Well, it wasn't long before we were making as much money, if not more money, with our glass division, right? So we had the firehouse glass, and they would replace windows and fix rock chips. So businesses grow from businesses, and that's what true entrepreneurs do, is like, oh, here's a good opportunity. Here's a, something I can add on to that to make even more money. So I had firehouse glass, and that was, that was really profitable, and that was fun. And What am I missing, Tanner? Anything? Yep. That, Tanner was great. But he goes on his mission, and he's thinking, you know, when I come back, I'm going to go to BYU. I can be a manager at one of these car washes. By then, my dad will have 10 or 12, because we were going to have this rapid expansion. And I get a phone call from the nation's largest car wash company, and they're like, hey, we want to come to Utah. We'd like to buy you. Here's an offer. I said, I'm not for sale. And he goes, well, let me, let me just, will you just look at this offer? And I'm like, ah. Oh. I said, I'm really not for sale. And he goes, if the number's big enough, everyone's for sale. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so I opened the envelope, and I'm like, yeah, I'm for sale. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you, one of the most difficult letters I've ever written in my life were to my two sons who are on missions that said, dear son, I sold the family business while you were away. <laughs> What? But it was, it was fun. And that was, we owned the business for about five years. Uh, we kept the glass portion. We'd created some software while I was there. So we talk about Omega Glass. So we have this rock chip company. My company now makes these bridges that fix it, the resins. We created a software that most, car, most glass businesses in the nation now use to process their auto glass claims, replacement and repairs. That's just a fun little business that sits on the side that you know, one of our employees manages. And so that's what I've learned is as you're successful, great things keep happening, and new things, and new windows open, and it's so much fun. But now I'm sitting there again, OK, now I'm, I'm you know, a 45-year-old guy with no business. What do I do next? But I, I had figured out that I loved running businesses and doing things. So we started down this bucket list with my wife and I, what do we want to do? What are the things we're gonna, we'd like to do? One of them was, we'll never do food. The restaurant business is so difficult. People are fickle. I don't want to do food. I have friends. My buddy, Bob Nilsson, owns Cafe Rio. He's dedicated his life to food, right? He graduated from school. He worked for PepsiCo. He traveled all over the world, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Pizza Hut, did all this stuff. So he knows food. That's great for him. You go do that. Then he was the president of Burger King. He should come talk here sometime. He'd be great. President of Burger King. And then he quit Burger King, said, I'm just moving back to Utah because I want a simpler life. And he bought Cafe Rio from the founder. And now he runs Cafe Rio. And it's, it's great. And his son, Josh, is good friends with my son. And he went to school here for a while. Now he's off running a pest control company, I think. But anyway, my point was, we're not doing restaurants, but we can do other stuff. So we got involved in. Uh, the medicine business. I didn't know anything about medicine. Right? There's a company called Alliance Health here in Utah. It's been one of the fastest growing companies. My good friend is the founder and the CEO. And so I called him. I said, hey, what, what opportunities? And he goes, well, we need pharmacies. So what do you mean? He goes, we're sending so many prescriptions out. We need pharmacies. Great. So I went and bought pharmacies across the country. And then he'd put all of his patients through these pharmacies. Well, that's great. You know, so. We, we started Wall Street Health. We have pharmacies. The company that we were, I was buying millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of drugs every month. And I thought, well, why shouldn't I buy them for myself instead of someone else? So we started a wholesale drug company, right? Because as entrepreneurs, that's the way we think. It's a sickness. That's what I was saying. It's, it's like ADD. It's like, how many things can I do? Along that path, I also learned about me that I love to grow businesses. And there are people that are good at it, and there's people that aren't so good at it. And that's one of the things I'd recommend if you do start a business. Sometimes you'll have the great idea. Sometimes you can get the business going. 
but also be humble enough to go, you know what, maybe I'm not great at this or that, and I can bring someone in that can help me in that area. Those are the skills I honed was how to grow a business. I, like I said, I didn't always have the great idea up front, but I knew how to take it to the next level and the next level and the next level. So I started getting phone calls from friends. One of my dear friend, we worked at the temple together in Draper, and that's one of the ways that I kept balance in my life was to make sure every week I'd go to the temple. And we were there, and he was like, Dow, you grow businesses. My business is struggling. And I said, what's your business? He said, we make slush. And he said, I'm in three states. We're here in Utah. It's great slush. We're in, you know, we're in a few of the gas stations. We're in Top Stop. We're in the Holiday Oils. I went and tried his slush, and I went, your product's great. Tell me about your distribution. Tell me about this. And, he's, and so we talked for a while. Not in the temple, after. <laughs> and and, and it, as an entrepreneur, my eyes just open. I'm like, I love your business model. He's like, why? And I'm like, well, you're doing it wrong, but I love your product, and there's a way we could shift this, and we could make it. And so I said, I, he goes, well, come help me. And I said, you know, sure. Sell me part of your company. I'll infuse a bunch of capital. We'll grow this thing. Who's had a frazzle before? You know what I'm talking about. They're good, huh? How, what's better than tiger's blood? I mean, it's so good. It's just the best. Anyway, how are we doing time-wise? What time is it? OK. So what does an entrepreneur do? He sits and goes, OK, we're going to restructure this company. Well, five years later, Frazzle is now the second largest slush company in the nation. Who can guess what number one is? Slurpee and Icy, right? Same product. They're the 800-pound gorilla. But we've like 20 times the business. We're distributed in you know, every state in the country now. And the product's amazing. And we sell sugar. Imagine this. We sell a box of sugar. It's like 10 pounds of sugar for $90 by adding a little flavoring and a little color to it. Does it solve a problem? Ah, it makes people happy. What's the pain point? Eh, kids are screaming. Here, tap a frazzle. Shut up. <laughs> um, and I love the entrepreneurial classes where you try to figure all that out. What, is your problem, what does your product do? And what problem does it solve? And, and you know what I love about this business? It's recession proof. You know what happened when the recession hit? Kids still bought sugar. People still buy medicine. So I'm smarter than I even think sometimes because I, <laughs> I just get lucky. I'm like, OK, if you have diabetes, because my pharmacy is focused on diabetes. You are going to buy your product, whether it's a recession or not a recession, right? If you're a parent and your kid's screaming, you're going to buy a slushy, whether they're, you know, that last dollar, you'll pull it out of your pocket and go, okay, go get a treat, because you love your kids. But what a brilliant business my friend came up with, because he's selling sugar for $90 a box. It's like $3, you know, worth of ingredients to make this product. Of course, there's distribution costs, and we have the cost of the machines, but it's just an awesome business. So I love these ideas that people come up with. So if you're an idea person, get it. Run with it. Put everything you have into it. There's a book out there called All In. You can't be 90% in. You can't be 95% in if you're going to be an entrepreneur. You have to be all in. And then you have to work really, really hard. And the, sometimes those are two different things. Like emotionally, you have to be all in. But you have to work really hard. Um, I will close by telling you about my last business. And then anyone that has questions and wants to talk, you know, I know there's a different session and we can talk specifically. But this, this was an overview and a couple of thoughts and the things that matter most to me. But things change in your life, right? So I told my wife, look, we're never doing food. Food's horrible. I don't understand it. I ate a sandwich from the most amazing restaurant for years. And these cinnamon rolls were delicious. And this single guy, run, his, he and his family run this little restaurant. And I was always like, hey, when are you going to expand? I'm never expanding. I'm happy. People find that happiness. He doesn't think like me. He's had one restaurant, 20 years. He makes, I'm not supposed to say, he makes a lot of money running a single restaurant. Like, you know, more than $300,000 a year. <laughs> but less than a million. How's that? Somewhere in there. Running a single store with sandwiches and cinnamon rolls. And, and it was like, he's like, why? He was, I don't want to work any harder. I'm happy. And I respect that. You know, again, like I said earlier, to their own self be true. Figure out who you are and what you want. So one day, my partner and I, 
convinced him, like, look, the world needs your food. It's great. It's really the best food ever. We just opened one in Lehigh, right in Thanksgiving Point, so it's not that far to drive. You need to go there and visit. And I live for the cinnamon rolls. I literally would be 20 pounds less if it weren't for cinnamon rolls. They're like this big, and they're so good. But it's called the Village Baker, and we convinced him. We're like, look, sell us the rights. Let us take this product to the world. And he's like, ah, you're the 500th person that's asked for that. Ha, ha, ha. And we're like, no, I have a plan. Here's the plan. Here's what you do. Here, you don't have to, you know. All of a sudden, his wheels were spinning. It was like the guy at Nordstrom. You just have to show up. And you have to have a plan. And you have to believe in your plan. And next thing you know, he's like, well, let me think about it. I was like, you know what? I kind of like this. And the next thing you know, my partner and I had the worldwide exclusive for the Village Baker brand. He still has his shop. He runs it. We have two stores. We were just selected by the LDS Church as the new restaurant in their brand new building downtown called 111 Main. It's part of City Center. It's where Goldman Sachs is going to be. There's like 8,000 employees in the tower. And as they come off the elevator, the only store there is the Village Baker, where they sell sandwiches and amazing cinnamon rolls and pizzas and salads. And so the world is going to get to enjoy our food. And I am in the food business, and I promise never to be in the food business. But why? Because it, there's going to be 50 locations. I don't always blaze the path myself. There's a gentleman who lives in Utah County, Andrew Smith. He became the, he got the rights to Neaters eight years ago. I watched him. I was like, hey, that's pretty cool. He's doing a good job. There's 45th Neater store opened like a month, just this last month. And talk about, you know, a great business and a way to make a lot of money and a way to put a lot of people to work. And so I see things and I learn from Andrew. I'm like, Andrew, tell me about your business. And he's like, Dad, you should probably get in the food business if you've got a good brand. It's been, and so my brand had been validated. People loved it. All of the important things you'll learn in your entrepreneur class really matter. I never would have said, well, I'm going to go start a restaurant and hire a chef, and we're going to try to create recipes. That's too much work for me. That works for some people if you're a food guy and you've been doing food your whole life. But my goal is, as an entrepreneur, is to find things that work. Great ideas now, and sometimes that's being the founder of those, and sometimes that's being the guy that shows up late, but with capital and a plan, and can really boost the sales and growth. And so that's where I'm spending my time now in my career, is just finding winning businesses or winning ideas and accelerating them and helping them grow. If I had to summarize my career in just a couple of words, oh, you know what? There's a boat. I told you, right? We owned the same thing in 2008. They were about to go out of business. They called and they were like, hey, I'm going to go out of business. You're one of my customers. I was like, well, I only really want one thing. I want part of ownership of your company, but I just want a boat every year to use. Right? So sometimes our investments are to make money. And sometimes they're just for fun. And that's how I got the BYU boat. Because that was this year's boat. They're like, Dow, here's the boat. Use it. It was a lot of fun. So I think I covered all the pictures up there. Um, but what I've learned, if you still go to the next slide, is I'm not going to take time for five things. But I do want to talk about one thing. One thing that I learned, and I would tell everyone, is that a huge part of my success, and many people I know success, in life is just to show up. It's really easy, really easy sometimes to go, oh, I know there's a club meeting tonight, but I'm going to stay here on the couch and watch, what's that show, Strange Things, Stranger Things, that's, we're binge watching that right now. But, <laughs> you've all done it, you know what I'm talking about. But there's times where you're like, I have to go, I just have to go do this. I have lived my life knowing that, I, that if you show up at things, event meetings, I didn't know anything. I was like, maybe I'll get in the car wash business. I don't know. We're out of time, right? Yep. Um, but car wash business, I didn't know anything about it. So I just got on a plane and went and visited car washes around the country, talked to owners. I showed up in an industry and said, I want to learn all I can. So I've learned that showing up matters so much. Don't be complacent. Don't think I can be successful and just sit on the sidelines. Force yourself to be in the thick of things. Because when you're involved and you go talk to people and you get in those things, it really will make a difference in your life. The second thing I've learned is 
to work. And I have a really good, good story. But the second thing I w learned is be willing and be prepared to work really hard. If you want success and you want to be an entrepreneur, it is the road less traveled. It's really easy to get a job. I came from a big company today where I had this hairy meeting and it was super negotiation and tough and I was stressed out. As I sat there for 20 minutes because I got there early to be ready, I just watched all these, these employees just kind of wandering around and I was like, oh my gosh, what a great life. They go to work, they walk around, they act busy, they get a paycheck, they go home and binge watch every television show on Netflix. <laughs> and that's their life. And that's not so bad if that's what's important to you. But it's not the life of an entrepreneur. And I have to look into everyone's eyes and tell them that. Because you can't be a successful entrepreneur. You can't make things happen just being part of, the way, part of the way in. It is hard work. I've enjoyed spending this last 45 minutes with you. Um, I am grateful to have a wonderful family, a wife that understands that you, it is hard work and it has yoked up with me and we pull together to raise a family and to be successful in business. I'm grateful for my membership in a church that believes in hard work and I'm grateful to be able to give back, not only to the church, but to the community and this school. This is the Founders Week. Com uh, the Founders Week. And there's a lot of great people I get to rub shoulders with and, and give back to BYU, even though I was only someone who attended here. I went on the BYU Jerusalem program, which was awesome. And so thank you for your time today. Great being with you.